moon. Sorry for the break between videos, between you and me, it's been a zany few weeks. But I'm mostly okay and mostly back to it. I mean, this is a sci-fi movie episode, and I tend to knock those out of the park. So this should be great, right? I mean, this is a film where not even I can make a case that it's about love, because this is a movie that doesn't contain any actual love. Like, Sam doesn't even love himself very much. Little on the nose movie. And if I sound different, I'm not sorry. Shit changes, get used to it. My body is very much not back to normal. Moon is a 2009 film made on a $5 million budget in 33 days, written by Nathan Parker, not that Nate Parker, a man known almost entirely for this, and directed by Duncan Jones, a dude known for the vastly underrated source code and the vastly Warcraft... Warcraft. We're going to spend the grand total runtime of this video on the first one, the Sam Rockwell tour to force you to not know he had in him. Except for me, I knew Sammy Boy would crush the world all the way back in Charlie's Angels, a movie that did not age. And I don't mean age well. This movie didn't age at all. And trust me, it feels like the most perfectly actualized temporal distortion field. I mean, this thing bends the very fabric of time. Moon opens with the world in peril. An energy crisis on Earth has left us in the lurch. For whatever reason, we're now collecting helium from the moon and shipping it back. That feels recklessly cost and effective to me. You have to pay shipping costs from the- Okay, the main idea is this. We need the moon to live now. Sam, as Sam Bell in the movie That's a Stretch, is nearing the end of a shockingly inhumane three-year stint alone by himself on the moon. He is ready to come home. After a quick rinse and the use of the Wayne's World suck cut, he's ready to hawk a loogie into the lunar dust and GTFO. It's gotten to Sam, being up there alone for all that time so that he can ship money back home and his wife can afford off-camera child carrier support. Why do people always have servants to carry their children in movies? You realize no one has that, right? Not everyone has a nanny they can rely on when they're shooting the confessional segments. Take this away, thank you. Anyway, he's having inferred unspecific marital woes with the missus, so he's struggling during his last two weeks on the job. We know he's exhausted from the work after so long, but he's also irritable and restless because he thinks he's going home. It's the night before camp for old Sammy. Anyway, stuff starts going wrong and the moon habitat AI Gertie, played with quiet psychopathic applause by Kevin Spacey begins to act strange and secretive while Sam starts seeing people that aren't there. I'm in specific plot person, hi, hello. Before too long, Gertie has started shutting him out of what Sam perceives to be his job, so that isn't really helping the whole case of the grumpies thing. Sam finds, to his surprise, another Sam out there on the moon's surface and does his best impression of Magnum P.I. to try and divine a solution to the problem at hand. Or at the very least, get some answers from the computer that is doing its best impression of HAL 9000 at the moment. To add an insult to injury, the computer refers to the Stoppelganger almost immediately by his full name, Sam Bell. Clones are like NBD in this future, so... This movie unloads both barrels of its freak flag so fast that you kind of have to sit with awe that this movie is willing to get as weird as quickly. Sam Rockwell is just hanging out with himself already in this movie, and what I think is especially clever is that Sam Bell is dodging his own clone. Like, no amount of college dorm room lack of eye contact is going to save you, dude. Hey, this movie really is like the real world. We learn quickly that people don't have the moral capacity to admit when they know they're a clone. Obviously, by law of conservation of materials, at least one of them has to be a clone. I'm just running the numbers here. But Sam won't lighten up on Sam, and we start to really feel for the guy. You got stuck on a three-year boondoggle to the moon, and you just found out you're a clone. I don't think there's a Hallmark card for that. Sam does manage to find common ground with literally himself, and the meaner Sam eventually begins to lighten up. Then they start to put it together. What's fascinating is that by virtue of being clones that exist on completely different points in the Sam Bell timeline, the clones each have a distinctive personality specific to their existence. 
Guess that whole nature versus nurture argument isn't holding water so hot. New Sam hasn't been doing this that long, and he has a pretty desperate case of the please God validate my efforts disease. So he has far more of a hothead pretending he knows what is going on all the time. Dude, I think they might have figured out you ain't no shit. The version of Sam we've been following since the beginning is just way more chill about everything, man. He's on the RA track. As Sam Prime begins to unwind, so too does the other Sam start to take on some of his more charming characteristics. Then they fight because their human capacity for understanding their situation is completely non-existent. Shocker, it was a tie and the two Sams have again a shaky truce between them. But hey, might as well rip the bandaid off so Gertie tells our Sam, Sam Prime, that what he definitely does not want to hear. He is a clone. All of his memories are implanted and there is no home. There is no home because the moon is his home. But the moon isn't good enough. And that's when this movie gets rowdy. The clones are operating on having absolutely nothing to lose, which will now act as a goal for our newly minted, psychologically devastated meat people. Jesus Christ! Turns out clones have a shelf life and our hero is pushing close to that just one more bowl of cereal date, which is when Sam Prime finds the records of the clones that have come before him. He makes a quick FaceTime to Earth and meets his 15-year-old daughter and her new father, but more importantly informs Sam that his wife has passed on, and this movie is just not going to stop beating up on him, is it? He's clinging to life like a Browns fan. Can we cut him a little slack? Gertie's trying to kill you, man. Actually, this is one of the only sci-fi movies where the robot doesn't go full Cruella de Vil which I appreciate. Turns out this is K-Pax Kevin Spacey. You would not believe how hard it is to name a Kevin Spacey movie where he's nice. Which brings us again to the question of agency. Though, unlike Ex Machina, I don't think there's going to be any wiggle room on the moral objectivism here. These aren't robots, these are people. What happens in Moon is objectively wrong. Sure, it's easy to make a case that humanity needs the energy this experiment is no doubt harnessing, but there's really no reason for humanity to be this cruel. We're bad and dumb, but we aren't that bad and dumb, are we? I'm asking for real. We aren't this bad and dumb, right? It was Rene Descartes that originally coined the phrase, I think, therefore, I am. Some of that phrase comes from the very underpinnings of consciousness, but it was Descartes struggling with his own lack of existence, ergo, I doubt, therefore, I am, that led him down the pathway that being able to claim your existence is equally important to having it. To exist, we must stand Stand up and say, I am, or more on brand, I believe, therefore, I am. While the fact that Sam is a clone is a moral puzzle that we should struggle with for about 14 seconds before doing the right thing, what we should glean from this film is that never-ceasing interminability of the human spirit. Sam exists and believes he exists, therefore, he is valid. That devoid of purpose and mission, i.e. his wife is dead and his daughter has a good life without him, which means he has no home to go home to. We will create purpose for ourselves in the hopes of achieving it. Even with no home, Sam still very much wants to make his way to Earth and create a home because that's his right to do so. If you can't return to your home because a home does not exist, then make one. And while we're on the subject, it's a lot tougher to draw a line excusing humanity's behavior against a clone that does not maintain the information to know that A, they are a clone, and B, know why any of this is happening to them than it is against a robot. At least when you make this sentience, you can lay claim to owning it, where you'd still be wrong, and let's walk away for the time being over the nigh-limitless plot motivation in film by corporate greed. Yes, I understand there is a bottom line in place here, but I imagine most of their expenditure is because they're shipping helium from the dark side of the moon, less so Sam. Just because you were capable of making clones that doesn't give you the right to in any way, abuse them, and yet, here we are. excusing the needs of the many for the needs of the one. Sure, Sam signed a contract that no doubt benefited he and his wife into the employee of seemingly limitless off-screen child carriers, so Sam's objective money more friends from a simple get home to a much more complicated make a home over the course of the film. I mean, our baby boo Rockwell has to earn it. That's really all that this movie is about. Find a way to make a home before the situation and the elements like kill you and stuff and boy howdy do they try that is what is beautiful about sam bell's story against all odds he manages to pull the disparate aspects of his personality together so that he can stand up against those that have enslaved him and say i am but anyway you can sign a contract that allows the creation and subsequent confused subjugation of said clones 
We don't need to prove Sam Prime's agency, but we do have to support it and ask ourselves questions about what we do to save our humanity because the world appears to be sacrificing theirs. Hey, the question does matter. Are you really saving humanity if you're sacrificing what little of it you still have? The thing motivating our clones isn't even real. They just stare at nondescript wallet photos and continue doing their job without ever fully asking why. In a lot of ways, it's like Short Circuit or Blade Runner or Chappie or Ghost in the Shell or Ex Machina or AI or 50 episodes of Star Trek or WALL-E or Robocop or The Iron Giant or Metropolis or Westworld or... And if you recall, asking why and sowing doubt is one of the key signifiers of agency. The ability to ask, why have you forsaken me? And the answer might be because humanity wasn't all that worth being saved in the first place. That's why Sam is a great hero in the story. He is created to have an end date, much like all of us. But he is not ready to die, even if his body clearly is. Which is a thing I know a thing or two about lately. The timing of me doing this and me getting out of the hospital made this quite a bit more difficult to watch and simply get through, but it's important that we do it. Which I felt. Sam does everything in his power to break off a piece just for him, not his family, which wasn't really his to claim in the first place. He will go to Earth and make his home because when he is at his worst, he could still look up and say, I am. Because I'm still here. <sighs> Hey, that is another uh, Movies of Mikey in the can, and honestly, it feels good just to be making stuff again. There's always a lot of me in the show, and the episode hit me quite a bit harder than normal. Per usual, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, because at this point, I'm starting to dream about that silver play button, which happens at 100,000 subscribers. By the way, we're definitely not right there, but we can start setting goals, right? Like, Mikey needs a silver play button, I can hang my keys from it. Oh, and follow me on Twitter because that is where I extol the bulk of my childish mannerizing. On to the votes. Gosh, you guys are going to hate me for this one, but let's go ahead and throw up uh, Arrival, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Rogue One. There. Three popular movies, but three that I definitely have things to say about. Get your vote in the comments, and as always, keep your heads held high, friends.